Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Arab Center, Washington, DC. Uh, my name is Khalil Jahshan. I'm executive director of the center. And I would like to welcome you to this uh, series of conversation uh, with key uh, specialists in Arab affairs and Middle East affairs in, in general. We are delighted today uh, to have our good friend, uh, Mehran uh, Kamrava, visit us from uh, Doha. Uh, Qatar, where he serves as professor of government uh, at Georgetown uh, University in Qatar. And also he heads uh, Iranian, the Iranian Studies uh, Unit uh, at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, also uh, based uh, in, in Doha. Mehran, welcome. It's good to have you. And uh, especially, uh, I'd like to spend the next few minutes uh, chatting with you on the JCPOA, uh, the fact that uh, we've had uh, talks in Vienna uh, for several years and now try, trying uh, to reach an accommodation or an understanding, and, and yet uh, things seems to have uh, bogged down uh, for some reason or another, which we will uh, enter to uh, in, in a minute. But I would like to start with uh, essentially the announcement today uh, by the EU uh, foreign policy chief, uh, Joseph Borrell, uh, saying that after uh, two months uh, of deadlock, uh, efforts to revive the 2015 uh, accord between Iran and world powers uh, seem to be getting back uh, on track. Do you share that perspective with him? Do you think they are getting back on track? And, and uh, or what's the, the context of his remark? Uh, first, Khalid, let me thank you for having me over. Uh, it's a pleasure and an thank honor you. being here. The Arab Center of Washington is uh, a, a true source of uh, uh, inspiration and uh, knowledge and sound analysis. And uh, we're you. all the better uh, for the effort that uh, you and your wonderful team um, uh, produce. Um, I think there is a desire on everybody's part to uh, make sure that the uh, negotiations move forward. But there are some serious structural problems, uh, not the least of which we're witnessing as we speak, which is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so uh, almost all of the different parties that are involved in the negotiations for one reason or another are bogged down in uh, the, their own reasons and their own activities that um, ha that prevents them from making concerted and serious efforts. Nonetheless, uh, I think the uh, announcement by uh, Joseph Borrell is a very positive development, and I sincerely hope that um, we do see some substantive uh, moves in that regard. Uh, for the benefit of the uninitiated among our constituents, what are they trying to achieve? in Vienna. What is the JCPOA about? Why are we renegotiating an already negotiated and signed agreement going back to 2015? That's an excellent question. Uh, the reason is because in uh, 2018, uh, the United States withdrew from uh, the JCPOA. As you just- That's the Trump administration. Yes, yeah. the, the Trump administration. Uh, as you just mentioned, the JCPOA, which was signed in 2015, was the product of years of very difficult uh, negotiations, uh, spanning several administrations in both Tehran and in Washington, DC. And finally, in 2015, uh, all sides developed the necessary political will to make very difficult decisions and come together uh, through uh, the 2015 JCPOA. Unfortunately, the United States pulled out and not only did it uh, um, pull out of the agreement, but after 2018, and unfortunately continuing into the Biden administration, the United States continues to impose new sanctions on Iran and makes it all the more difficult on the Iranian side to come to um, negotiations because it's taking far more political capital by the administration in Tehran to go back to uh, the negotiating table. 
I keep hearing from the Iranian side, and if anybody could explain it, uh, you definitely have the experience okay, and the expertise uh, to help us with that. Uh, they keep saying they're waiting for answers from Washington. Mm -hmm. Answers to what? What is it that Iran wants to hear from Washington to proceed forward with these negotiations? Mm -hmm. Well, the difficult negotiations uh, are being conducted behind the scenes. And the Iranians made a decision at the start of the renegotiations not to speak directly to the Americans because they said uh, we cannot trust them. So they're speaking to each other through intermediaries, mostly through the EU foreign policy chief and, and uh, sometimes the uh, Iraqis. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Qataris. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're seeing is that it, it is taking time for each side to articulate its position on different issues. So right now, the two big um, issues on which there appear to be negotiations behind the scenes are the delisting of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps um, uh, uh, the IRGC, uh, which was declared a terrorist organization by the Trump administration and underwent uh, sanctions. And then the unfreezing of Iran's assets, not lifting of the sanctions, but the unblocking of assets that Iran has from the sale of its oil in places like South Korea, between seven to $10 billion of Iranian assets are frozen in South Korea, in Japan, in China, and in various European countries. So those are the two big obstacles over which they're negotiating and they wait for each other's responses. Now, when you refer to the issue of trust or lack thereof, uh, which are of course crucial to, to the success of any uh, negotiations anywhere, uh, it is not, the issue of trust is not that uniform on the Iranian side, correct? I mean, there are probably different uh, political camps, uh, groups, uh, the, the, you know, the different sectors uh, in the government and beyond the government who view this uh, in a different or look at it from a different prison. Are there different power centers uh, yes. in Iran on this? A very good question. Up until 2015, uh, actually 2018, I should mm -hmm. say, uh, there were groups that either trusted or did not trust the United States. And uh, the so-called moderates uh, of former President Rouhani and former Foreign Minister Zarif, those were the people who said an international agreement that is signed by the United States and other European uh, powers can be trusted. These are reputable international actors. After 2018, the equation changed. The United States withdrew from the JCPOA okay. and the European Union didn't have the courage or the political capital to live up to its end of the bargain in so far as the sanctions were concerned. So the Europeans also followed suit by default, followed uh, the American um, sanctions regime because uh, they, they didn't want to uh, run uh, afoul of the Trump administration. So right now, universally, there is lack of trust in Tehran of the Americans. And there's mistrust uh, universally and suspicion that if an agreement is signed, uh, it's only a temporary agreement because uh, we uh, know that early in May of 2022, uh, 62 American senators passed a non-binding resolution uh, calling on the Biden administration not to engage in negotiations with Iran. Of that 62 senators, no less than 16 were Democrats from the president's own uh, political party. And so the Iranians see these and point to these developments and say, obviously, the Americans can't be trusted. And those voices in Tehran that said, no, the Americans can be trusted, John Kerry, Barack Obama, of course, those are now on the defensive. And in many ways, they don't have a leg to stand on. Uh, is this why Iran 
insisted on adding some preconditions in a way, demanding from the Biden administration to secure the agreement if they were to reach one and sign it, uh, to secure it beyond the life of the administration. Exactly, absolutely. Um, the problem with that, as you know, is that there are two classes of sanctions. There are those that are imposed as a result of executive order by the mm -hmm. US president. And then there are those that are enacted by the Congress of the United States. So unless and until there are congressional acts that reverse or somehow remedy the sanctions, many of those sanctions cannot be lifted. And of course, there is no way to predict uh, which way congressional elections are going to go. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, we, the, the Iranians are aware that uh, what they're asking for is something that uh, in many ways cannot be guaranteed. And there are voices in Tehran right now that say, yes, the Americans withdrew from the JCPOA, but they also withdrew from the Paris Accord. They also threatened to withdraw from uh, NATO or not withdraw, but withhold funding from NATO. And the Trump administration reneged on a whole host of America's international obligations, only one of which was the JCPOA. So mm -hmm. there is an awareness in Iran that um, no sovereign uh, uh, actor can guarantee indefinitely the international treaties which it signs. Many experts uh, in Washington, D.C., and many of uh, whom you're quite familiar with, have uh, recently uh, made the statement that the parties have made some progress thus far. However, reaching an agreement is unlikely. Why are they saying that? Because it takes tremendous political capital on all sides to uh, finalize an agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, the, uh, we know that in the United States, the level of popular uh, discourse against Iran is quite pervasive, and uh, uh, both in the media, in popular culture. Uh, and, uh, and among policy elites. So for the Biden administration, there needs to be um, a tremendous political will to make an agreement happen. And the question of whether that political will or political capital exists in Washington, uh, uh, the answer is not clear. In same thing, of course, in Iran, because although the... Um, Iranians are aware that they do need some sort of sanctions relief, but the question is at what cost and for how long? Because if the Americans are going to extract all sorts of concessions when it comes to the IAEA, when it comes to centrifuges, when it comes to probably Iran uh, uh, severing or lessening some of its ties with its proxies uh, around the region, when it comes to all of those concessions that is expected of Iran, is it worth it for Iran? For how long? Mm -hmm. If the sanctions will be reimposed in short order, when and if the Trump administration is no longer around? And so I think uh, the devil is always in the details. And that is one of the main reasons uh, why neither side wants to expend that, that necessary political capital for that final push. I think most of uh, our audience uh, are probably aware of the rationale or the reason uh, why uh, the US is being uh, hesitant, particularly of course on the conservative side, which happens to be or tends to be Republican. But as you said, in, in the Senate on, on that uh, resolution that was passed, uh, uh, there were some Democrats who joined uh, Republicans uh, uh, on this issue, objecting uh, in a way to reaching uh, or returning uh, to the uh, agreement. Uh, help us understand the Iranian side. Uh, is there opposition to this agreement? I mean, is the government there facing, uh, even though we tend to think that uh, the, the government in Iran is hardline enough, but is, are there more hardline 
opposition, uh, if you will, forces in, in Iran that are objecting to this totally. They don't want these negotiations to resume. Um, well, uh, the answer is uh, yes and no, because there is a keen awareness across the political spectrum in Iran that it is in Iran's advantage to engage in negotiations. But you know, and I know that, for example, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations have been going on for decades ad nauseum to no end. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, so, so there are parties in Iran that say, yeah, let's negotiate, but let's not be in a, be in a hurry to reach a final mm -hmm. uh, settlement. And the reason, the logic that guides that assumption is the fact that Iran uh, uh, doesn't have much to gain, really, uh, even if the negotiations were to succeed. And so the only way, they argue, for Iran to benefit from negotiations is if the Americans see that Iran is serious about its nuclear about a nuclear weapons program. Then the Americans will come to the negotiating table. The Americans aren't going to come uh, uh, to negotiating table over some centrifuges. But if they realize that there is indeed uh, a military dimension to the Iranian nuclear program, if they recognize that there is more to the Iranian nuclear boogeyman that they have propped up, then they are willing to make meaningful concessions to Iran. So yes, there are uh, gradations of hardliners in Iran, or there are policy differences. There are very robust policy discussions going on in Tehran. And one group says that, so even if we negotiate, what, are, what is going to be the end result? We might get a couple of passenger airliners, we might get uh, a little bit of uh, French um, investment, uh, investment by French or German, other European companies, but uh, the outcome won't be as dramatic as if uh, we actually had something to give up. And uh, uh, the, 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 the so-called hardliners in Iran assume that uh, it is only through uh, more centrifuges and advances in the nuclear program that the Americans would then give meaningful substantive concessions to the Iranians. Are there any uh, issues that you, in your judgment uh, you deem as deal breakers where we are right now? What do you think might derail totally, bring it to a dead end? One of the geniuses of the Rouhani administration was that he was able to bring all the Iranian factions together and sell the idea to Khamenei, the so-called supreme leader, to support the nuclear negotiations. And in return for some red lines, one of those red lines is the uh, missile program. And the other red line is the uh, frozen assets yes. that Iran has. So right now, if the Americans come or the Europeans come, the other side comes and says, we, we, uh, we will not negotiate unless Iran uh, reduces significantly its uh, missile program, that's a deal breaker. Or if the Americans come and or Europeans and say, well, you know what, let's negotiate, let's have a an agreement, but Iran's uh, assets would remain frozen in Europe or in North Korea, uh, South Korea or Japan. That is also another deal breaker. Thank you. Uh, in terms of, of the uh, frozen sanctions, you referred to them a couple of times. Uh, most people in the United States tend to misunderstand uh, the nature, the impact of these sanctions on life daily life in Iran, and the magnitude of these sanctions. Could you help us understand why is Iran making a big deal? Is, are the sanctions that important to be removed? Yes, as you know, we live in a globalized world. And uh, any 
simple product, whether it is um, uh, a television set or an air conditioner or an automobile, has parts from multiple parts of the world. And so if Iran is economically, technologically, industrially cut off from the rest of the world, there's only so much development that can occur domestically. Mm -hmm. There's only so much economic production that can take place. So at a very basic level, the sanctions have isolated Iran and have impeded its ability to be a developing country, a developing country, which by definition it is. So that is one level. But there are additional layers to the sanctions. For example, Iran is cut off from international banking. And so the millions of Iranians who live outside of Iran cannot uh, send money back and forth. That is uh, not a possibility. Travel to and from Iran itself is very difficult. Any sort of uh, exchange of goods is difficult. Uh, as an Iranian American, when I go to Iran, I cannot give a lecture, for example, at a university, lest it would benefit somehow Iran's development. Mm -hmm. And so the sanctions are so comprehensive and are aimed really at uh, making life quite unbearable. The logic of the sanctions, the overall logic of the sanctions is that they would put pressure on the people who would in turn put pressure on the, the government. government to modify its behavior. That's the logic of the sanctions. The problem is they're putting pressure on the people, but that pressure on the people is not translating, conveyed. is not being conveyed to pressure on the government. The government itself is insulated. And so the sanctions ironically end up disempowering Iranian civil society. They end up weakening the ability of the people to uh, uh, put pressure on the government in various ways. Uh, the recent uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, by Russia seems to have spilled over into this uh, issue of, 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 the, of the fate uh, of the Vienna talks. Why are the Russians uh, all of a sudden becoming uh, uh, have, having an impact directly and asking for preconditions themselves on proceeding forward. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Khalil, unfortunately, what we're witnessing is that conditions today are far more complicated than those that existed in 2015. Yes. And so the, the original JCPOA was much easier to put together than, the, than whatever is happening today. So the Russians now with their invasion, of course, and the subsequent sanctions that were imposed on them have uh, uh, placed a number of demands, but probably the most important is that they want to be exempt. Uh, they, they want their trade with Iran to be exempt from the sanctions that uh, they are currently experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for the Russians, uh, the JCPOA or the negotiations in Vienna present a window of opportunity to try and press, uh, to put whatever pressure they can on the United States and the European Union for their own benefit. And one of that, of course, one of the things they've uh, uh, zeroed in on is the sanctions and they want their trade with Iran to be uh, 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 to be exempt. That to me is a red herring because that sanctions was never, it was never an issue. It's not as if the volume of trade is of such magnitude uh, between Iran and Russia that would significantly impact Russia's international trade. Uh, uh, but it was a signal uh, by the Russians that uh, we can be spoilers if we want. Excellent. Uh, as political scientists, you and I have been uh, trained to avoid as much as possible predictions. Uh, let me uh, violate that <laughs> training uh, or that uh, principle and ask you, on June 6th, 
what do you think will be happening uh, in terms of the JCPOA? Are they going to be back together negotiating or uh, that's impossible? So long as it's be between me and you only <laughs> and not the camera. <laughs> um, uh, it is, uh, of course, hard to predict. Uh, everybody is aware of the need for some substantive progress. This has been going on for far too long, and there really is a lot at stake. The problem is that the atmospherics are not right. The problem is that there are far too many other developments. The European Union is uh, preoccupied with Ukraine, with Putin, with Brexit. The uh, Americans uh, have, a, have a congressional uh, election coming up, midterm elections coming up. Uh, and, and of course, um, uh, the Biden administration doesn't seem to have the political will to make the concessions that the Iranians are demanding. The Iranians, of course, have their own problems because they uh, don't want to be seen as if th this administration doesn't want to be seen as if it's giving up more than the Rouhani administration gave up in order to reach the 2015 agreement. But there's this awareness, nonetheless, that you need some sort of an agreement. So I think the odds are 50-50. Uh, I tend to be optimistic by nature, uh, but I have to temper that optimism with a measure of sober realism that the, um, uh, there are far too many obstacles to be, uh, to be any more optimistic more than 50%. Sober realism. Let's uh, end it uh, here uh, with this uh, cautious uh, conclusion. Uh, Mehran, thank you so much for your uh, being generous with your time uh, visiting with us today. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I hope you uh, found these uh, remarks uh, very uh, instructive uh, and useful as you attempt, like the rest of us, to understand a complicated situation uh, in U.S.-Iranian relations. Uh, thank you on behalf of Arab Center, Washington, D.C., and we invite you to join us in future programs.